Hey guys, so in this past week's Torah portion, the portion of Shvot of Exodus, Israel is introduced to evil for the first time. We've met evil in the stories of Genesis before, eating from the fruit, Cain killing Abel, the generation of the flood, and so on. But this is the first time that on the international scene, Israel begins an actual face-off with evil. And that's going to be a pattern that repeats itself throughout our history. The people of the Bible, the value of the Bible versus the people who are not that, who are anti that. And we know that there's always something really important hidden in the first time an idea appears in the Torah. Hashem puts a deep meaning when he introduces us to a new concept. So here's this showdown for the first time. How does it begin? I want to take a deep dive into those very first verses of the encounter between Pharaoh and Israel. I want to look closely and see what we can pull out of them. Let's start in chapter 1, verse 8. It starts with telling us that a new Pharaoh arises who didn't know about Joseph. And then he opens his mouth. What is the very first thing he says? It says in Hebrew, Vayomer el Amo. Pharaoh spoke to his people, to his nation. He said, Hine am b'me Israel, rav v'atzumimeno. At first reading, what verse 8 means is that there is there are these children of Israel and there are people that's going to grow and become greater than us. They might make a war against us, so we need to figure out how to stop them. But if you read it closely, the sentence can actually bro be broken down into two parts. And if you read the first part, the very first thing he actually says is just, Hine am b'me Israel. The children, of our, is, uh, the children of Israel are a nation. He exclaims, the children of Israel are a nation. I don't like where this is going. You know, then they're going to become more than us. They might make a war. But the actual fundamental thing that bothers him is that Israel are acting like a people. That's what bothers evil. Now we know a very deep concept that the sages always teach us is that ma'aseh avot siman labanim, which means the things that happened to our forefathers in the Bible will be a roadmap for what is going to happen to us in future generations. So the Torah is telling us what is it going to look like to be in exile, to meet darkness. And the first thing that happens according to our Torah portion, here and forever after, are those is those first words of Pharaoh. Hine am b'nei Israel. The children of Israel are our people. The first thing that bothers Pharaoh is the peoplehood of Israel. It rubs in the wrong way. These children of Israel, they're not acting like immigrant minorities. They're supposed to, you know, integrate into society, assimilate, melt into the cultural melting pot. There's something different about these guys. They're not just a tribe of immigrants. They're having their own rules, their own way of life. They're an actual full-fledged people. I don't like this. Now think about how this pattern is going to repeat itself throughout history. That was the first exile in Egypt. When was the next exile? The next exile was after the destruction of the first temple. We read about that in the book of Esther under the rule of Ahasuerus. Israel is in exile once again and meets evil in the form of Haman. And what is the first thing that comes out of Haman's mouth? In the book of Esther, Mordechai didn't want to bow down. Haman does this whole lottery. He wants to kill the Jews, but then he actually talks. And what's the first thing he says? The first thing he goes to the king and he says in verse in uh, chapter 3, verse 8, he says, Yeshno am echad. There is this one nation. And he goes, and they don't follow your rules and we should, uh, you know, they're dangerous. We should kill them. They have different laws. But the fundamental first thing he says is almost identical to Pharaoh. He says, these Jews, you think they're just a tribe of people? They're just random immigrants? No, they're a nation. And now look at the last exile when we were in exile from the second temple. Who was the ultimate worst evil that we met in our last exile? I think we would all immediately think of the Holocaust. There were 2,000 years of exile where in the Christian and Muslim world, everyone was trying to, co to convert the Jews and persecuted us for not converting. But what differentiated that ultimate evil of the Holocaust? It was that... It didn't even help if you converted to Christianity. It was enough for you to just be genetically even one quarter Jewish, just one Jewish grandparent. It didn't matter how German you felt or acted. It was as if you could hear the echo of Pharaoh and the echo of Haman saying, there's this people. Israel is a people. They're a nation. We don't like this. And now what's so mind blowing is that if you look at the very first recorded essay written by Hitler, the very first writings that we have that have been discovered from Hitler, it was an essay written on September 16th, 1919. And it's the very first thing we have from him. And it's like a broken record. Look at the first words he opens up with. He says, to begin with, meaning first point that I want to make. And I'm quoting, he says, the Jews are unquestionably a race, not a religious community. 
the Jew never describes himself as a Jewish German, a Jewish Pole or a Jewish American, but always as a German Jew, a Polish Jew, an American Jew. And then he goes on and says, even the Mosaic faith, however great in its importance for the preservation of their race, cannot be the sole criterion for deciding who is a Jew and who is not. Meaning the very first time Hitler sits down with a pen and paper to write something, that great evil force of our third exile, the first thing he wants to exclaim and tell people is the same thing that Pharaoh exclaimed and the same thing that Haman exclaimed. These Jews, they're not just a religion. They are a people. A people has a history and a future, and that is not a good thing. And what's so shocking is that just like Pharaoh in our portion that says, let's make a cunning plan. Hitler writes that the problem in his mind is emotional anti-Semitism. He says emotional anti-Semitism has found its expression in the form of pogroms. But then he writes rational anti-Semitism, by contrast, must lead to a systematic and legal struggle and, the, uh, and uh, against the privileges that the Jews enjoy. And then he goes on and says, the final objective must be the total removal of all Jews from our midst. So what we see is that the very first thing that Pharaoh notices, the very first thing Haman notices, the very first thing Hitler notices, the Jewish people are a people. Step one, Hashem is giving us the roadmap. The side of darkness will be agitated and uncomfortable and angry when the Jews stand up and say, we are a nation, we are a people. When we show that to the world, the side of evil wakes up. And look at verse 10 right here in our portion. Pharaoh says, let us deal shrewdly with them lest they increase. And if a war befall us, they will join our enemies and wage war against us and then depart from the land. What could be a more irrational argument than this? He says, well, we have this tribe. We're the big superpower of the Middle East. We're Egypt. Maybe this little tribe, they have a pretty high birth rate. They're going to make a war against us and, and overtake us. That's totally irrational in and of itself. But let's go with him. Okay, let's say he's right. Wouldn't he want them to depart the land? But then he says, lest they depart the land. If they're so awful, don't you want them to depart from the land? So here we see it again mapped out. Step two, after noticing they're a nation, you go, this little nation is going to take over the world, right? There, this paranoia. And then step three, you would think you'd be happy for them to leave you alone, but then Eva will say, they're going to leave. Where are they going to leave to, if not back to the land of Israel? So we start with recognizing they're a nation, then this paranoia that they're going to overtake us, and then this fear that they're going to leave and make their own they make their own land. What could be less clever and cunning? Pharaoh says, let's do something clever and cunning, but he says something that sounds absurd and completely unclever. He says, these people are going to outnumber us and, and then overtake us and then go make Aliyah. That is just a really weird argument, but maybe... While it sounds nutty, it's actually not so nutty at all. Maybe he's tapping into something really true and really deep that he doesn't know how to articulate it, but it feels it down in his guts. Maybe he feels something intuitively. Maybe the side of evil knows something intuitively. They might not be able to articulate it in a way that makes sense and sounds rational, but they mean something really deep. The Jews are a people. They're not going to fit in. They're not going to be one of us. They're not just going to assimilate and disappear. But in the bottom line, the greatest fear is exactly what Pharaoh says in the end of verse 10. Penya alu min ha'aretz. Maybe they will leave our land and go back to Israel and make a Jewish kingdom. Why is that so scary to him? He doesn't tell us. But maybe he's expressing what he knows deep down, what always the side of evil knows deep down, that the Jewish people living in the land according to the Torah and the word of God will bring a light to the world that the side of evil can sniff out. They sense it and they don't want that. They're always going to be against that. And look how that pattern repeats itself. Haman gets Ahasuerus to agree to kill the Jews. But if they hate the Jews so much, wouldn't they just want to send them back to Israel instead of having them with them in Persia? But instead, in the book of Ezra, we see none other than Ahasuerus himself putting a building freeze on the temple, trying to shut down the reestablishment of our second commonwealth. He feels it. He feels it deep down. And then look at the Holocaust, the great evil of our last exile. If the Jews were vermin, like Hitler argued, if the Jews are taking over the world, like the elders of Zionist, you know, the elders of Zion uh, propaganda was trying to, you know, teach the world, shouldn't they have just encouraged Zionism? Wouldn't they have just been happy? Get out of here, get out of Germany, clear Europe from the Jews. It seems totally irrational, but we know that in reality, Germany locked the gates. They wouldn't let the Jews out. 
Not only them, the Jews that did manage to escape, the British were blockading the boats of Jews escaping from the gas chambers and not letting them into the land of Israel. Everyone feels it, even if they don't say why. They don't want Israel to return to their land as a people following the word of God. And we continue to see this today. Sometimes I watch the news and I get so discouraged. I see the lies. It, they don't even make sense. Like Jews are making an apartheid state, the only democracy in the Middle East where any minorities have any rights at all. They're the aggressors. They're the apartheid. That doesn't make any sense. And then you see rising anti-Semitism in the world. You'd think their response would be great. Go to Israel, make your own country, get out of here. But those same anti-Semites will still tell you, no, give away your land, your occupiers in Judea. There's nothing coherent about it, but it's actually pretty smart because the side of evil knows deep down, even in ways they can articulate rationally, that the resurrection of the people of Israel living freely in their land, according to the Torah, will be a force of redemption and light. And the Torah mapped this all out ahead of time for us. Is it to say, this is the blueprint, get ready. This is the pattern, be awake, pay attention. Because when you see this happen, that's when you need to decide which side. There's gonna be a line in the sand, which side are you going to be on? And that's when you know, when you see this pattern repeating itself, that you are at the cusp of redemption and it's not a coincidence, it's part of Hashem's plan. So instead of getting frustrated and discouraged by the evil, we look at the evil and we look at those lies and we say, good, I'm glad. I'm glad this is happening. I might have been upset. I might have been scared, but I already read the end of the story. I know that in just two more Torah portions, we're going to get to the Exodus. We're going to get to the splitting of the sea, the redemption. I know where this story goes. And I know it repeats itself again and again throughout history and in every exile. Whenever there's a showdown between good and evil, I know where this story is going. So I'm not nervous. I'm just going to sit and wait with Emuna and Bitachon with faith to watch Hashem's plan unfold in the most beautiful, miraculous, and redemptive way. So with that, I hope you guys all have a beautiful, inspired, and courageous week. Bye, guys. Hi, my name is Jeremy Gimpel. A lot of people want to know exactly what the Land of Israel Fellowship is and what members receive when they join. So let me explain. The Land of Israel Fellowship is a global online community with hundreds of members from over 40 countries around the world. Their live sessions and gatherings that create a direct personal connection to the land of Israel and to lovers of Israel from around the world. There's no online gathering that I'm familiar with that is connected to the land of Israel that unites and brings together such a diverse group of people, backgrounds and nationalities. It feels like prophecy. It feels like something we need in these times, like a window in to a better future on the horizon. There's a divine unity we experience every week in our fellowship broadcast. We heard these amazing teachings from an authentic Hebrew and Israel perspective and our jaws drop. Not only because they ring so true and are such a blessing, because they are so consistent with what we believe. These Sunday morning gatherings are nothing less than a house of prayer for all nations. Cindy Lowe, the United States of America. The Land of Israel Fellowship is an amazing resource for learning Torah, the Bible, and the prophets unfiltered and uncentered directly from the land of Israel. We've been studying Torah for almost 20 years, but we feel we are stepping into it more than ever and seeing new depth and dimensions to scripture. We're encouraged more and more every week. Callan Ardell, USA. Members receive access to all the archives in the library of teachings on every portion of the Torah, the biblical feasts, Hebrew prayer, prophecy, sessions on the ancient wisdom of the prophets of Israel, to help us navigate through these turbulent times. These sessions are so rich. I re-listen to each, and truly each session is the best one yet. Tehila is a tremendous asset and the teachings Ari shares are so rich. I've read the Bible so many times and I've known the things you are teaching. The Hebrew understanding is what Christians have missed for centuries. Sister Georgian from Germany. The Land of Israel Fellowship is truly unique because it's built upon personal relationships with the teachers of the fellowship, myself, Rabbi Arya Bramwitz in Tehillah Gimpel. Every member has direct access to the staff 24 six via email or direct WhatsApp to ask questions, to comment, to connect directly to all the teachers. And over the last years, we've connected to some of the most beautiful people on the planet. So if you wanna find out more and join the Land of Israel Fellowship, you can click on the link below. And if you wanna try it out for just a month, you can email fellowship at thelandofisrael.com and we'll hook you up. I hope to see you. Shalom from the mountains of Judea.